Grace and peace, everyone. I'm excited about this evening because I know the Lord is going to move this evening. You know how I know this? Leonardo DiCaprio won the Oscars last night. So, so we are in a season of miracles. Amen? <laughs> Turn with me, for the opening word, turn with me to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, as we settle our hearts and our minds on the word of God this evening. Great to see all of you, as usual. Wonderful to be out here, to be under the roof, safe, together, in fellowship, having the amazing opportunity to press into the word of God and to hear from his spirit. So we're in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 for our opening word this evening. And for those of you who would like to mark out in your Bible right now, uh, Revelation, we are currently in Revelation chapter 10. Just to give you a heads up, we're going to be turning to Revelation chapter 10. Once we are done with the opening word. The word of the Lord to you and to myself. Book of Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostle he had chosen. After his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. Verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates The Father has said by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Take one minute to reread that passage to yourself, and as you are reading that over the course of a minute, open your heart to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and we will begin in about one minute together. What is happening here in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8? The title Acts is actually short for a longer title, many scholars will say. 
that Acts would, could be entitled Acts of the Apostles. Others will say it is really the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit. The star of this book is the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Not a force, not an energy, but a person. Not just any person, but a divine person. And not a divine person, but the definitive person of whom anchors all of creation, the Holy Spirit. And we see here in the opening chapters of the book of Acts the importance of remaining open to the Holy Spirit. For what purpose? What does Jesus say to the apostles? His opening words are what? Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. But in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus here unveiling the promise of the Father with a greater specific time, saying this promise, the very promise that was foretold in Holy Scripture, the promise that we see given in the book of Ezekiel regarding the new covenant, the promise given in the book of jo Joel regarding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this promise, Jesus says, the promise given by our Heavenly Father is coming. But you must abide in the city of Jerusalem, Jesus says. Wait in the city of Jerusalem. Wait in the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace. Wait in the place of peace. Wait in the space of expectancy. Dwell in the place of deep rest for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And in hearing these words, the apostles respond to Jesus. In, in, in verse 6, we see that they gathered around him and they said, Lord, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so they were, as good Jews in the second temple period, awaiting a political advent that has been foretold. Okay, Jesus, that's cool. You know, you're telling us to wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's all right, praise God. But, but I mean, like, what's up with the kingdom and the nation of Israel? Like, is that going to happen? And Jesus responds to their question in verse 7. We are, for those of you who just joined us, we are in the book of Acts for our opening word, chapter 1. Verse 7, Jesus responds. He says to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Chill. Relax. <laughs> cool down. Understand the place of authority. It is the Father's will that will have its final flexing. The Father's will. Rest and abide under his authority. And wait. Verse 8. But you will receive power. Repeat with me, power. power. Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And notice where they will be witnesses. In the place of peace, the city of David, Jerusalem. And then Jesus moves out, saying, and in all Judea and Samaria, Samaritans, Samaritans, those, ha those half-breed people who have twisted theologies, the Holy Spirit is going to empower me to dwell with them, to speak to them. 
the Samaritans were not even to commingle with the Samaritans. Jesus goes on to say, and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord to you and I for this evening. If you find yourself dry, if you find yourself cold and brittle, if you find yourself thirsting for more, if you see within yourself a kind of lack and a yearning, turn to the Father and ask with faith, ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot do this walk without the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be Christians without the presence of the Spirit in our lives, working in our lives and through us. And so when we find ourselves awaiting peace, looking for a kind of transaction that can give us satisfaction. Turn to the Father and say, Father, Father God, Heavenly Father, pour out the gift of your Holy Spirit on me. I need to be refreshed. I need to be refilled. That I may glorify you in all that I do. Father, I am struggling with the flesh. Father God, I am finding myself slipping and sometimes stumbling. And Lord, I see that in that season of slipping and stumbling, I'm not really satisfied. Lord, pour out the gift of your Holy Spirit on me. Father, I notice that my heart is somewhat cold. Lord, I have a disposition that is inward focused. I don't want to serve in ministry. In fact, ministry has become a tiresome activity. Lord, I, I, I don't want to exercise the gifts you've given me. I, I just don't want to, Lord. When you feel like that, ask the Father to pour out his Holy Spirit on you. Amen? Amen? Check this out. The secret to the Christian life is very simple. And is, here's the secret. The Holy Spirit. He is our counselor. He is our strength. He is the one who will give us the words to speak and guide our minds with right thoughts. The Holy Spirit will anchor us in the presence of our Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one who ushers in the Shekinah glory into our respective homes, in our business spaces, in our bedrooms. The Holy Spirit is the one who awakens you sometimes in the middle of the night to cry out to the Lord, to pray. The Holy Spirit puts on your heart the burden to pray for others. And the Holy Spirit is the one who reminds us where we have faltered, not to condemn us, but to invite us back to the place of mercy, the place of grace, that space of peace. Amen? And so, if you all want, and speaking to myself first and foremost, if I want greater effectiveness in my service to the Lord, in my service to my fellow sisters and brothers, and in my service to the world, especially those who do not know Jesus, I must ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I must ask for a rebaptizing, a re-infilling of His precious Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the manifest presence of the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. I'll say that again. The Holy Spirit is the manifest presence of the Father's love for the Son 
and the Son's love for the Father. And that the Father in and through the Son would give us his Holy Spirit is a profound mystery. Because when you and I receive the Holy Spirit, sisters and brothers, we are actually ushered into the very heart of God. We are ushered into not just the presence of God, but even into his heart. That the Spirit of God takes up residence in your being is an amazing, amazing truth. But that the Holy Spirit desires to dwell upon you with power is kind of like icing on a cake. That the Lord will give us power to stand for the truth. Power to do his will. Power to lay our hands on those who need healing. Power to speak a word in season. And the Holy Spirit grants us power to run the race and to fight the good fight is the gift of the Father. Amen? With that said, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our weaknesses. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would cleanse us right now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We plead the blood of Christ on behalf of our conscience, of our hearts, the blood of Jesus on behalf of our bodies. It is by your wound, Lord Jesus, we are healed. Lord, you received the piercing on the cross for the sake of the world, and we are thankful for that. We are reminded of your love and of your enabling presence in our lives. And so, Lord, in this memory, we celebrate your goodness. We turn to you with expectation, with hearts that are filled with thanksgiving. And Lord, we say hallelujah. We say thank you. We worship you, Lord, because there is none like you. No one is like you. Nothing can compare. You are the author and finisher of our faith. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, we worship you. Glory to you, O God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory to you. Father, we ask that you would open your word as you always do faithfully here. Open your word to us, Lord, that we may receive the good gifts you have to give us this evening. We ask that you would refresh us that you would revive us, that you would awaken us, stir deep within us the dream that you have implanted within us. Remind us of our calling. Remind us of our testimonies, Lord, what you have brought us through. Help us never to take for granted your goodness and what you've done in our lives and who you are. We worship you, Lord. And so, Father, we ask that you would receive all the praise and glory this evening as we dive deep into your word. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Mm. Leonardo DiCaprio won the Oscars. <laughs> I've got to say that again. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Excuse me, chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. 
Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Just got real. How's everyone feeling today? Good? You guys are alive? Uh oh. Hmm. Here we are. Revelation. The revealing of God's final plan for all of humanity and all of creation. The revealing of God's final plan for all of humanity and of all creation. God is the engineer of the cosmos. The Lord is the architect of the universe. God is that one who dwells beyond, check this, isness. He neither is nor is not, for God alone is the ground of all being. And out of the infinite abyss of God's profound heart, God's word comes forth. We are reminded in the book of Hebrews that it is by his word all of creation is upheld. That same word became flesh. That same word that holds all things together is the one word who is fully God and by virtue of his mercy fully human. The one word the one mediator between God and man. Who am I referring to? Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ. The author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ is the red thread that unites the Old and the New Testaments together. Our Lord Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is here portrayed in the book of Revelation as the one who is executing judgment on a world that is broken and completely rebellious. We saw that in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 9, the last few verses, I actually want to reread that verse those series of verses to get us started for chapter 10. In chapter 9, verse 20, it reads, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, the plagues that we spoke of last week, still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping de demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Verse 21, nor did they, who is the they here? Humanity. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. The final word in chapter 9 is this. Here's the final word in chapter 9. Rebellion. Rebellion. And we see the depth of rebellion here in an amazing way. Precisely because we see humanity saying no to God, no to reason. Humanity is saying no to wisdom. In the face of tremendous judgment and wrath from God, we see here the word rebellion, that there's something fundamentally twisted in our humanity that we are naturally disposed to be against God, naturally disposed 
to be against God. The Bible calls this sinfulness or sin nature. And this sinfulness or sin nature that we possess was precipitated by the event called the fall. The fall. Remember Adam and Eve? Remember the serpent? Remember the garden? The fall. Fall from what? The fall from grace. For every time rebellion is exercised, it is always a descent downward. I want to say that again. Every time rebellion is exercised, and of course, we're speaking of what kind of rebellion? Rebellion against who? God, right? Because sometimes you've got to rebel against other things, and that's actually good. So I'm not just using rebellion in that way, right? Every time rebellion against God happens, there is a descent where? Where? Downward. It is a fall. But praise be to God that our Lord chased us down by taking upon human flesh so that he can tabernacle with you and with myself and rescue us from that downward descent. Do you remember remember who you were before the cross? I, I, I... Sometimes I forget for like a minute. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. But I'm sorry. I, just, I, I know. I gotta. Do you remember? I mean, that. I mean, listen. Rebellion is real. Rebellion is real, but God's mercy chased us down. God's grace saved us. We were rebelling against God, saying no to the living Lord. As it's, we find in the book of uh, Acts, the, Lord, the author of life. We took our life and said no to the author of life. Day in and day out. We rebelled against God with a voice that God himself gave. We said no. We used language and our wills against the one who gave us the ability to speak and to will. We ran from God with legs that God himself fashioned. We rose our fists against heaven. Very fists that our Lord fashioned in our mother's womb. We dived headlong into sins too shameful to speak in the light. And our Father sent his son to take upon the wrath that you and I deserved. Jesus jumped in the way, jumped right in front of that bullet that was for you and I and saved us. Some of us have come from a life of real, deep, dark, addiction some of us coming some of us are coming from a place of brokenness emotional brokenness from homes where we never even heard the word i love you that phrase some of us have been abused have been trampled on we have been neglected we've been mocked Some of us have done much damage to others. We've hurt many people. All of this, all of those testimonies on the dark side 
is a symptom of what's true for all of humanity, that we are broken creatures in desperate need of God's grace. And yet you and I are here. Not because we mustered up enough goodness to be good. We, were, we are here because our Lord rescued us. But what we see in the end of chapter 9 is this. Human beings, in their propensity, in their taste for the things of the flesh, remain rebellious. Some human beings remain rebellious to the end. What is it about the deception of sin that gets us insane like that? Like, what is, what is going on? But then the Father comes and does surgery on our hearts. And so that's where we were left off in chapter 9. And so now we are in chapter 10. There's a shift in scenery as we continue to move through the apocalyptic literature here. And so I'm going to read chapter 10. And as I read through chapter 10, let us open our hearts to the living Lord and see what he has to say to us. This is God's word to you. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like a roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Hmm. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the, land, in the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. Verse 9. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me this little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The word of the Lord. I want to give you all two minutes, just two minutes, to re-read that passage. As you're reading through that passage, you may want to highlight or underline anything that stands out to you. As you're reading it, you want to read it contemplatively with a heart open to the Lord and ask the Lord as you're reading, what is this? Amen? So I'll give you about two minutes, two or three minutes. I'll be keeping track of time.
All right. So as it usually is, Revelation, <laughs> filled with so much uh, yeah, mystery, imagery, allegory, metaphor, so many things happening here. So, you know, you read a passage like this and you sit with it and you're scratching your head. And, the, 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 you know, the typical... The typical Christian is like, I don't know what to do with this. And, and, and for good reason. This is not an easy passage. Much of Revelation is a difficult book to sift through. Because the question is like, what does all this mean? What is the significance? And so the, so the, so the Father through the Spirit invites us to go deeper. And, you know, praise be to God, this is why we are together. And so... Before we get started in, in plowing through some of these verses, are there, is there any, would anyone like to share uh, maybe a, a word or a sentence or something that stood out to you in this passage in, in chapter 10? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, here's what the commentators say. They'll say that, the, first of all, that this is echoing what's happening in Ezekiel and other prophets, which we'll, we'll take a look at as we go through this. But the sweetness in the mouth signifies, just like what you said, the sweetness of the knowledge and, what the commentators would add, the proclamation of the word of the Lord. That when you proclaim the gospel, when you communicate the love of God and the justice of God, there's something delicious about it. Amen? But the sourness in the stomach signify the persecution that is to follow when people do not accept the word. The divisiveness of the word, as Jesus says in the Gospels, I have not come to bring peace on earth but a sword. A very interesting passage there speaks of the division that occurs when the word of life is proclaimed. And as anybody here has, has done just that, you've, let's say, shared the good news to somebody or whatnot, you're going to have different reactions. Some are like, wow, that's amazing. Others are like, you better get out of here with that. And you may even experience a worse kind of rejection. And so that's what, uh, what's, being, what's being signified there in the metaphorical phrase of the taste being sweet but the stomach being sour with regards to the same scroll which here signifies the word of God okay and so we'll 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 we'll, we'll explore this as we go into it and so let's let's, let's jump right into it verse 1 2 and so on of 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 chapter 10 and so it says then I saw another mighty angel let's stop right there what is John saying I I I, I saw another mighty angel now, as we already know, the gospel of, excuse me, the book of Revelation is filled with angelic orders. High seraphim, cherubim, celestial beings. You have the beasts, uh, the four living creatures, and this, and the 24 elders. And so, this saying, and I saw again, that phraseology you see in the opening of chapter 10, I saw another, is just adding to the plethora of the many celestial angels that celestial beings, rather, that John the theologian is receiving in the vision. And this is not just any angel. This is a what? A mighty, a mighty angel. Let's, let's continue to read this here. It says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. So we have that descent from the place of glory to the visual space of John. Consider the movement of angels descending. 
There are two kinds of angels that descend in Scripture. You have the one kind of angel like we see here that descend on behalf of the Father. They descend on behalf of the Father. The Father sends forth His Word. The angels hurry to perform it. Amen? And they descend to perform the Word. That's one kind of angelic movement we see in the Scripture. But there's another kind of angelic movement, don't we see in Scripture? An angelic movement that's not descending on behalf of the Father, but in rebellion to the Father. Rebellion to the Father, which we will actually see later on in the book of Revelation. Those angels do not descend on behalf of the Father. They descend against the will of the Father. It is not just a descent with grace and glory, but it is what the Bible calls a fall. Remember Jesus said with regarding Satan, I saw him, speaking of Satan, fall from heaven. We're going to see later on in the book of Revelation that a third of the angels fall from heaven. They were deceived by the great serpent, the dragon, that is Satan himself. So we have two kinds of descents here. That also speaks to us with regards to evangelism. Some of us have real burdens. I pray that all of us have burdens for those who do not know the glorious message of our Lord Jesus Christ. But some of us have a particular burden for a family, for a loved one, a co-worker, someone that we know just doesn't know the Lord personally, like he so graciously revealed to us. Amen? What we, what we see here is this. First of all, the word angel means sent one in Greek. Sent one, angilou in Greek, sent or messenger. Has the same meaning both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. And so if you, sister and brothers, if you and I want to be angelic in our proclamation of the gospel, what we must first do is this. We must get down to people's levels. We must come down from heaven and communicate with people face to face with love. Amen? We have to be able to communicate with folks. You can't speak to people from another place. You have to descend and get to where people are. It's kind of like what Paul says in one of the scriptures in the New Testament. He says, to the Jew, I become like a Jew. To the non-Jew, I become like a non-Jew. So that in many ways, I can win people over to Christ. Amen? So the angel here descending from heaven as not just any angel, but a mighty angel, is actually a wonderful instruction for you and I. If you want to do the will of the Father, learn to descend onto your knees to wash the feet of your brothers and sisters. If you want to do the will of your Father, learn to do what our Master taught us in the Gospel of John. Take a robe, fall to your knees, and begin to wash feet. Serve one another. Heal one another. Speak words of truth to one another. For we all, we all of us here owe one another love. Amen? Amen? And the language of love, guys, is the language of descent on behalf of the Father. To descend gracefully. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was, check this out, robed in a cloud. Speaking of his spatial location, his majesty. Jesus says, when I will come, I will come with the clouds. The clouds here signify two things. Number one, it signifies the height and the grandeur of this being. The bigness of this being to come down with the clouds. Right? And number two, the clouds signify witness. The witness of the saints. The witness of the saints. Okay? In other words, if you and I are to come with power, 
Listen carefully, please. If you and I are to come with power, if we're going to do the will of the Father with power, we must have people, we must have folks praying for us. We need people who are to intercede for us. If you know you're going to go, let's say, and, and, and visit family, and you know that may be a difficult time for whatever reason, don't be ashamed to reach out to some brothers and sisters and say, hey, I'm going to spend so-and-so time with, with this person or with these people. I love them. They're my family. But sometimes it gets rough. You know how it is. Please pray for me. Or I, I, I want to... I want to try to communicate the gospel. I want, to, I want to communicate God's love to my friend who's been really like, get out of here with that. Can you pray for me as I do that? Amen? So the power of prayer is the power of witness, which is what the clouds signify. Two things. The glory, the space, the power of this particular being, but it also signifies the prayers of those who can pray for you, who intercede for you, to be a witness before the throne of God. It continues here. His robed and cloaked with a rainbow above his head. The rainbow in the book of Revelation always signifies, number one, God's glory, God's beauty, in other words, in this context. And number two, the covenant. The covenant that God established with Noah. Do you remember that? The covenant not to destroy humanity by way of a flood again. That covenant is the covenant of mercy. The covenant of mercy. So the rainbow signifies the beauty of God, but also the mercy of God. His face was like the sun. Speaking of this angel's glory, majesty, and his legs, notice this here, were like fiery pillars. Mm, It does sound like Jesus. Here's a question that I have for everyone. Where in the book or where in the Old Testament do do you see this language, this talk about fiery pillars? Fiery pillars. Say it again. Boom! Moses! Moses. What does the fiery pillar do in relation to Moses, in relation to the children of Israel? To to, say it again? To guide. Amen. To guide. To guide. Right? Yeah. To guide the children of, of Israel. So in other words, the pillar of fire signifies the manifest expressed will of the Father. In other words, the will of the Father, his directive will. But it also signifies a judgment for those who reject God. Remember the pillar of fire came between the chariots of Pharaoh and the children of Israel when they were pressed against the waters of the Red Sea? So not only is it a space of witness, it is also a place of protection. Not only is it a space of witnessing to the will of the Father, but a place of protection. It's, it's interesting how there's so much here, right? Just In just some of these images here. Verse 2, he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. Let's stop there. The scroll, yes. Yes, you got it. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna unpack that in just a second. Well, we first want to say something about the scroll. The scroll here signifies the word of God. The fact that it's a small scroll does two things. It's hearkening back to a passage, to multiple passages in the Old Testament, which I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you some references so you can look that up for homework later. But the small scroll also signifies 
a portion of the larger scroll. A portion of the larger scroll. Remember the large scroll in the book of Revelation? The scroll that had how many seals on it? Seven seals. And who only had the right to take that scroll and open it? Only Jesus. That scroll signifies, and what does that scroll represent? It represents the final plan for humanity that God has. Jesus opens that scroll by opening up each seal. Each of those seals are representing waves of, of implicit and explicit judgment that God is pouring out on the world. And so we have a small scroll here, okay? And we have the feet of the angel, as Monique shared with us. We see planted right foot on the sea, left foot on the land. And then gives a loud shout, a loud shout with a voice, the roar of a lion. What does the feet signify? What do the feet signify? As Monique shared, power and dominion. That the Lord is the Lord of the land and of the sea. The Lord is the Lord of the land and of the sea. Now, you and I may say in our postmodern generation, where we have Google Maps and we have the Hubble Space Telescope and we're looking at like, all right, you know, so what? The land and the sea, we, can't, we get it. But in this historical context in which this is written 2,000 years ago, the land and the sea represent the what? The expanse of God's creation. Okay? That's why you have this sort of movement in the scripture, and we see this in chapter 9, where all things on the land, all things in the sea, all things in the air, right? Because in the ancient Greco-Roman culture, where this is written, they had a certain view of the cosmos or the world. The word cosmos comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world. And that vision of the world they had, the vision of the cosmos, said this, that it is all together, all unified, and it's huge. The angel, having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, is an image that says this, God is in control of both. The Lord is Lord of the sea. And he's Lord over the land. There's nothing that escapes him. You find yourself in turbulent seas, God is in control. You find yourself struggling on parched land, God is in control there. Amen? Amen. And he is a mighty angel who descends in the clouds, speaking of his height, speaking of his glory. So he's also in the air. And we're going to see in a few verses later that he raises his hand to give an oath before the living God. And his voice is like the voice of a what? A, the roar of a what? A lion. Ugh. I don't know what that would sound like. I'm just trying to imitate. I just tried to imitate that. Somebody pray for me. Rawr. <laughs> That's like a cub. That's like a baby lion. Rawr. You think of Lion King Simba. So this is, a, this is an unusual passage because in chapter 2, John is, there are two things happening here in chapter 2. Chapter 2, John is actually an active participant in this vision. You know, everywhere else, John is just chilling in the cut. It's like, look at, oh, snap, oh, man, right? Oh, and then the angel comes and says, oh, I don't know, oh, and he cries, right? John is just there, like, observing everything in this vision. But in, in here, in chapter 2, John is an actor in the vision. He's there participating. So this is quite interesting. I wonder what that would mean for those of us here where we, we are gifted with the prophetic, particularly with dreams and visions. Some of us here are gifted in that area. Some of us here, the Lord speaks to us through that channel, as it were. What does it mean, for, in, for instance, when in the vision that the Lord gives you, you are an active participant 
rather than a passive participant. That's something to think about. I want you to do a little research on that. A little, I'm not giving you no answers, not yet. But it's something to think about. When the Lord gives you a dream, when the Father gives you a vision, when the Lord gives you a prophetic insight, the question is this. What is the difference from being a passive observer to an active observer? What's the difference between those two? Something to think about, especially for those of you who are gifted in that area. And so what we want to do here is focus on the angel. What does the angel signify in essence? This is what the angel signifies in essence. It signifies not only the glory and power of God. The angel here signifies the, the glory and the power of God. But also deliverance for God's people. The glory and power of God and the deliverance for God's people. Last week, we spoke briefly about worship. And I said last week, when we find ourselves in a place of pressing, when we find ourselves struggling, let's say, worship the Lord anyway. Amen? Worship the Lord anyway, because what, what happens when you worship is you realign your vision to the glory and the power of God. When you worship, you reset your vision on the glory and the power of God. And when you begin to see God's glory and power, deliverance follows. Amen? Glory and power. Set your eyes on things above, not on earthly things, Paul writes. Behold the glory and power of God. And when you do that, you will find that deliverance is close at your heel. Freedom comes. But how do you get there? You see, the devil works through lying, through lying, through deception, through getting your eyes focused on a problem or a series of problems rather than focused on the Lord. Amen? But it's something I've said before, and I'll say it again over and over again. I never grow tired in saying it. You will either do one of the two things. You will either look at your God through the lens of your problems, which will make God very small, or you will look at your problems through the lens of God, which makes your problems very small. I want to say that again. You will either look at God through the lens of your issues and problems. Right? Which makes God very small, very marginal. Or you will look at your problems through the corrective lens of God. When you have a God vantage point, you look at your problems as superfluous, empty. Here today, gone tomorrow. This too will pass away. But you have to be in the space of God's glory and power to see that. Amen? How do we get there? Worship the Lord. For when we worship the Lord, you turn to the God that is all-powerful, all-beautiful, all-glorious. Well, what does that look like, Joe? What does that look like practically? Actually, very simple. If you're driving, you're having a bad day, and your mind starts racing with negative thoughts, and your heart grows heavy and burdened, throw some worship music on. Praise the Lord. Start praising the Lord. Oh, what does that look like? I don't want to be like that weirdo when, you know, I'm driving and someone's looking in and they see somebody, you know, singing and stuff. Be a weirdo anyway. Be weird for the Lord. Amen? Raise your voice to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Lord, I will praise you anyway. Remember, remember Paul and Silas. In the book of Acts. After they were beaten near to death. Thrown in the back of the prison. 
death, stench, rats. And in midnight, they raised an offering praise to the Lord. They started worshiping the Lord. Peter, James, John, and the apostles were lashed. They were whipped by the Sanhedrin. They praised the Lord. They said, man, praise be to God that we were found worthy to suffer on behalf of Jesus. What kind of thinking is that? You have to be in the spirit to say that. Right? <laughs> in the natural, we're like, I suffer. God, where are you? <laughs> and Paul and J these guys are like, praise be to God that, that the Lord will deem me worthy to participate in the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus. That I may just share in the suffering of Christ. That in some way I may participate in that. So that God gets more glory. And so when our bodies are wasting away, in one form or another, give praise to God for your spirit grows more powerful in each passing day. And don't be surprised when the spirit floods your body. And the miraculous happens. The transformative happens. Because you're ushering in, you're, you're pressing into the glory of God, to the beauty of God, to the presence of God. Amen? Amen. So worship the Lord anyway. Yes, yes. Mm. Yes. Right. Dead, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. And so it said that he was not able when they got to Nazareth mm. to produce or conduct miracles except for the laying on of hands and healing of these people. Mm -hmm. So I was curious that they don't see that as being a miracle. It's like no miracles except for that. And that in itself is a miracle. That's right. That's right. But you said it though, you said it with regards to the atmosphere of faith, that being the, center piece, the, the central piece there to see the manifest glory of God. And it connects, it connects with what we're saying here when, with regards to worship, because it raises the spirit up, right? It raises the mind and the heart. Exactly. 
Exactly. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 3, finishing verse 3. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Please write the following down. (laughs) Not that. (laughs) Write down Psalm 29. Something to look up when you have the time because this whole notion of the thunders speaking and the seven thunders actually echoes Psalm 29 where God speaks like thunder seven times. Since the Psalms celebrates the power of God as ruler of creation, it fits this context of the God who is sovereign over sea and land. So the connection between what's happening there with the thunders and Psalm 29 is this. It's reestablishing this. God is Lord over all creation. God is Lord over all creation. What's up with the secret? What's up with this this portion where the thunders are speaking and God says, don't write it down to John? What's going on there? Now, many have attempted to guess what it signifies. I suspect that in trying to do that, there's a direct disobedience to the word. If it says, don't look it up, don't look it up. But you can think about the place of that secret in the context of this revelation. Why put that passage, in other words, here in chapter 10 of Revelation? It signifies this. That secret signifies the following. God has determined the time when the church will know exactly when these events will happen. God has determined the time when the church will know the contents of his revelation, of when this is going to happen. That's actually good news because Jesus warns us that many will come and say that they are the Messiah. Many will lay out dates and times. Jesus is coming next week, Tuesday. Jesus is coming two days from now. You know, like, like what? Like the Lord is coming, right? And, and, and people get crazy. People get nuts with, de- with date setting, timekeeping. The Lord's co- Oh, that's it. The Lord's coming today. Right? Listen, the Lord comes today. Praise be to God. I'm out. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> and we, we, we're going up in glory. That's it. But the reality is we don't know the time. The Lord says, pay attention to the seasons. Be mindful when you see some of these things increase. Wars and pestilence and the weather gets crazy. He says, you know, the time is drawing nigh when I will appear. Be ready. But we don't know the time. We don't know exactly how God and when God will execute this. Amen? What does that mean for you and I? Here it is. Remain humble. Remain humble. Humble. Be careful what you watch on YouTube. Be careful what you see on TV. Test every word that is proclaimed or taught by any pulpit against the scriptures. Go home and do your homework. Don't be so passive in receiving whatever the person is saying in the front. Take their words and go home and test it against holy writ. Amen? Super important, so we won't get deceived, so we won't fall sway. We must be rooted in the word of God. Verse 5, then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said... There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Write the following scripture down. 
Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. You're going to do a lot of homework. You're going to go home and compare that. Because what's happening here is, is that that's hearkening back to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 7. Where the man, which is an angelic vision, clothed in linen, standing above the waters of the river, and lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. So this oath that the angel is taking before God is, I'll say this again, hearkening back to the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 7. And the oath is saying this, that God's word is coming forth. He is about to birth this thing. The time of waiting is over. The Lord is showing up. And the word of the Lord to some of us here this evening is this. The Lord is saying to some of us, I have seen your struggle." I have seen how long you've waited. I've seen what you've had to put up with. The Lord says to you this evening, I'm coming through. And the time of waiting is over. I'm going to break in to your life in such a way that you will not be able to doubt because you've been faithful in waiting. You've been faithful in your suffering. You've been faithful in waiting for justice. You've been faithful. And the Lord sees that. And the Lord is coming. He's coming and he's going to break through in whatever area you've been waiting for. That's the word of the Lord to some of you this evening. The Lord is showing up in a powerful way. The Lord sees. The Lord knows. He recognizes you've been faithful. He recognizes you've been prayerful. He recognizes you've been waiting for a long time. And the Lord is saying to you, I will be knocking on that door and I will expect it to be opened because I'm coming sooner than you think. Amen? So we're the Lord to some of us here. Hmm. Verse 8, then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. And so I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. In verse 10, I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about the many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Last scriptural reference I want to give to you this evening, and then we're going to close out with some words. This portion of Revelation that we're reading through, about the little scroll and eating it, is echoing the book of Ezekiel, one of the major prophets, Ezekiel, chapter 2, verse 8, all the way to chapter 3, verse 3. So Ezekiel 2, 8 to 3, 3. Ezekiel 2, 8 to 3, 3. And as we've already said, the scroll signifies the word of the, God, of the word of the Lord, the word of God. And what we are to do with the word of God. The Lord has given each and every one two kinds of callings. Number one, he's given each and every one of us the calling to be our true selves in the Lord. Our true selves, our real identity. He's called us, in other words, to be children of the Father. To be Christians. That is everyone's calling in this room. We are called to be the church to the world. Amen? But the Lord has given 
each of us an additional calling, a specific calling that he desires for you to live out in relation to the first calling. So you and I are called to be believers, but the question is, how are, to we, how are we to walk out our faithfulness to God every day? So the Lord has called some of us to be missionaries. The Lord has called some of us to be prayer warriors for a season. Maybe not for your whole life, but maybe for a season. Some of us for longer periods of time. Some of us have called, some of us the Lord has called us into the ministry of reconciliation in one form or another. Working in the forefronts of, of gender equality, racial uh, situations and discriminations, working as ministers of the gospel in those areas and others. The Lord has called some of us to be reconcilers in our homes, to be healers in the medical industry, to be teachers, to be people who fight for justice, to be homemakers, to be technicians. Amen? The Lord has called each and every one of us to walk the walk. Here's the truth of that call, however. As you take up the mantle and follow the Lord, as you begin to follow the heart of the Father and live out your true identity, you will be persecuted. You will be rejected. You will be at times disassociated from others because you are, as what they used to say in the 70s, a Jesus freak. You're a Jesus freak. Right? You, you, you take this Jesus thing too seriously. It's going to pass. It's a fade. It's a fad. It's something. It's going to, you know. Right? That's kind of like a light persecution. That's persecution light. Persecution 1.0. <laughs> you have others that are, that have set out in their hearts, unbeknownst to them because they are completely ruled by the wicked one, to make your life a living hell just because you profess the name of the Lord. They will mock you. They will jeer you. They will say, this person is nuts. Forgiving people, loving people, what kind of... They will. That's, that's persecution 1.3. Right? Then you have persecution 2.0, which is people or certain folks that are literally arrayed against you, sometimes in violent measures. Now, it's something about the human condition where we tend to focus on the self, we focus on particular situations, but it, there, it, there is no mystery here, sisters and brothers, that our family in God is suffering around the world. There is literally a genocide of Christians happening. Did you know that? Genocide. Christians are being eradicated in certain parts of the world. We think we are safe. We think we are fine, that we are okay. We are not. We're not. We don't want to take for granted the twofold work of the word in our lives. Number one, the word is sweet in the proclaiming of it. The word is sour when we are rejected. It hurts. It doesn't go down easy. The Lord has given some of us here a word to share with a loved one, a word of correction. But you're afraid to share it because you don't want to be rejected. Share it anyway in love. Be true to the Father. Be true to the Lord. Be true to the Holy Spirit. 
God will empower you. But you want to risk yourself for the Lord because he's given everything for you. Amen? You can never outgive God. You will only have full life when you enter into the suffering of others. You will only have full life when you enter into the suffering of others and allow your light to shine. Allow the Spirit of God to work through you. Walk the extra mile. Just repeating Jesus' words. When someone compels you to walk one mile, walk with them an additional mile. Give without expecting return. Practice hospitality. If someone needs company, rather than waiting the next day or the next day, I'll get, I'll get around to it, take up the offer now. Because in meeting that person in their need, you are meeting Jesus Christ himself. You are meeting the Lord himself. Of course, give up your seat in the train. That's tough. That's tough. Right? That's when it's like, I can do everything else. But I'm in New York. I don't know about all that. <laughs> you know, you get, you get cut off. You get cut off. You're driving. You get cut off. Mmm, Lord. Father God. Bless them anyway. Bless them. Bless them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, and when you fall, when you slip, and you, you know, something else comes out, Father, help me. Lord, you know, you know my temperament. You know my weaknesses, Lord. You know all things. Cover me with your grace. Cover me with your mercy. Help me to grow in this thing called sanctification. Empower me, Lord God, that I may be true to you. Amen? Amen. How can you love your Father in heaven whom you do not see and yet not love your sister and brother who you do see? First John. You must learn, we must learn to love one another. Serve one another. Amen? Amen? Descend like the angel and wash the feet of others. Forgive anyway. And the Lord will cover your back. Amen? And so, Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this evening, for this time together, for chapter 10 for the reminder of the importance of kindness, love, and grace. Teach us, Father, to be like that mighty angel we have seen in that chapter, that our faces may reveal the light of eternity, that we may possess a beauty that emanates from your spirit. Father, help us to walk into situations prayed up, and asking our sisters and brothers to pray for us. Father, help us to walk in the authority, in the dominion, and in the power that you have given us as your children. Because you have given us so much, and we tend to live off just the crumbs on a floor. You continually invite us to the feast, to the table, but we turn to the crumbs. Some of us are afraid to even come inside the house. We stay outside. But you are knocking on the heart of our doors, Lord. You, you are there, wooing us back to your side. And so, Father, we ask that you grant us the grace to grab a hold of your hand and to continue our journey with you. So, Father, we ask that you would continue to strengthen us, be with us for the remainder of this week. I bless each and every one of you in the strong name of Jesus Christ. No weapon formed against you will prosper. 
Remember, the enemy is a liar. Place your faith in the Lord. And always give him praise. Worship him nonstop. Worship him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. I love you all. Get home safe. Be well. God bless.